about how a grasp of knowledge of ignorance might be manifest in communication, although I'll talk a little bit about that. But I want to talk about children being sometimes explicit, talking explicitly about what they know, what they don't know, and what um, other people know and don't know. So, in some ways, my question is basically when the children start to have a concept of knowledge. But as you'll see, I'm going to be using data from explicit talk. And what's interesting about the work we've just been listening to is that it suggests that that explicit talk is moving on a fairly rich conceptual repertoire. So there may be some very important continuity between that pre verbal infant or semi verbal infant and the more positive two year olds that I'm going to be focusing on. So here's an overview. I want to talk very briefly, um, presupposing your knowledge, about the standard view of theory of mind development, in other words, a slow timetable, um, peaking at around three or four years of age. Uh, recent evidence of a faster timetable, especially from the infancy work. And what I'm trying to contribute to that then is a new look at children's language, which I see as in some sense intervening between the infant competence that we recently heard diagnosed and the more familiar competence that we think of as associated with preschoolers. And I'm going to try and do that by focusing on two um, aspects of children's competence. Um, their questions to other people and secondly their own explicit references to uh, knowing and not knowing. <coughs> so just to remind you of the standard view, and I'm not really talking so much about um, false belief as even about um, their understanding of knowledge, the standard view has been for a very long time that children don't really understand knowledge and ignorance until about three or four years if you test them through the explicit verbal tasks in which they may have seen an object hidden, um, somebody else may not have seen that same object hidden, and they're asked to make comments about what they know versus what the other person knows. And the basic finding is that this task is tricky until about three or four years of age. And those data have been corroborated uh, in cross-national studies, uh, China, in Iran, uh, notwithstanding slight variations in the time frame. So we're talking about a very solid view and a very, <coughs> a, a, a very gradualistic access then to some notion of knowledge, at least as diagnosed by this uh, knowledge ignorance task. But it's worth thinking about a faster timetable than we I mentioned earlier, well, though we've uh, just been presented with more evidence for this past review, but the, one of the first hints of a faster timetable was presented uh, in 96 by Daniela O'Neill, in which um, she had two and a half year olds who were in a room, and the experimenter would place an attractive object on a shelf somewhere beside the child, but out of reach. And the children were tested under two conditions. In one condition, the mother had been watching while this toy was placed on the shelf. In which case, although the child wanted the object, they didn't gesture very much or vocalize very much, in, implying that they realized that their mother knew as well as they did where the object was. On the other hand, if the mother had been out of the room, when the toy was placed on the shelf, came back in, under those circumstances, they would point, vocalize, as if recognizing then that she needed more information if she was going to, if, if she, the mother, was going to help them out to retrieve the toy from the shelf. Interestingly, this study, pioneering where it was, I and mean, innovative where it was, was in some sense left in limbo alongside the much larger work on knowledge and ignorance and theory of mind as, um, as we know. Tasks. But I think it was a, a forerunner, a harbinger of the later work that we've seen more recently. 
So this faster timetable is something that um, Ali has laid out very well. And um, together with John Lane, I recently reviewed various experimental studies going up to about 18 months, in which children not only engage in third party observation, but will spontaneously try to rectify um, a person's ignorance by communication. Particularly a person, again, who's coming into a room that hasn't seen an object that in this case they want, but may have been moved in their absence. And under these circumstances, children seem to appreciate that the person will not know where it is and will look for it, and they will offer these gestures of communication, helping the other person out, even before the person expresses obvious signs or makes an obvious request for some kind of information. So a spontaneous recognition of the person is ignorant of the update that they themselves want to and the spontaneous tendency to supply the information that this person needs. Okay, so that those data suggest that talkers have some understanding of knowledge and ignorance, and furthermore they have some understanding of how communication can be used to rectify ignorance and to convert it into knowledge. So that raises all the more um, acutely, in some sense, the puzzling question of why it is that children are doing so poorly on the classic tasks, and yet when we've, we've pulled together the various studies of infants and pre-verbal toddlers, we see such conflicts. So one way to try to figure out what's going on here, I think, is to look again at children's spontaneous language. I say again because there's some work that's been already done, and I'll briefly review that, because I think in some ways it underestimates what children um, are capable of. So, the analyses of language that have been done have been pioneered by um, Karen Barsh and Henry Wellman, and um, they were based on children's spontaneous utterances. Um, they gave a lot of sucker to the relatively slow timetable that I started off by describing. So, in particular, Barsh and Wellman identified two key mental verbs, think and know, which were fairly common, especially know in young children's utterances. But when they looked at the way in which these utterances these references to think and know were used, they concluded that children were not showing any cogent use of those two mental state words until around three or four years of age. In particular, on the basis of an analysis of what they call contrastors, where they looked at whether the child articulated some kind of difference between what they themselves knew and what somebody else knew or alternatively what they knew at this minute and what they knew or thought they knew at some earlier point in time. <coughs> Focusing on these contrastives, children were not doing terribly well in the sense that they were making these contrastives um, starting at around three years of age, but not before. So in other words, children lack any kind of explicit conception of knowledge until three years of age according to these data. So, as I said, the experimental evidence on the other hand would invite one to think that there must be surely something going on between 18 months and 36 months. Um, after all, um, that's a fairly lengthy period of time in these uh, early stages. We would think that there would be some stepping stones between the early competence and uh, later talk about knowledge and ignorance. So what I'm going to do is to show you another look, to give you, offer you another look at children's language, which I've done uh, in collaboration um, with Kelly Kuhn and by Yan. And just to, to, to rehearse the hypotheses, so one possibility is that Barsh and Roman basically um, got it right, 
that children talk about thoughts and beliefs does emerge at three to four years. But primarily, you see this gap because it takes a couple of years for this explicit discussion of cognitive states to come online. So in other words, you could argue, trying to put all the evidence together, that infants have at best some kind of implicit concept of knowledge of ignorance. And that's why we see their cognitive and communication both viewed as a third party and when they're engaged as a communicator themselves. An alternative hypothesis um, is that this timetable is incorrect, that actually two-year-olds have an explicit concept of knowledge, at least in the sense that they use know and think uh, cogently, and I'm going to just focus on know for this particular tool. And one argument for that would be if we could find that Barsh and Well would have discounted some important indicators of children talking cogently about knowledge. So here are a couple of predictions. First of all, that um, if toddlers understand that communication can rectify ignorance, we would expect them to use language fairly cogently to gather information, especially by asking information-seeking questions and not simply by um, posing questions in the form of pragmatic requests for help or permission or whatever. So the first prediction is pretty straightforward, that if we look at two-year-olds, we will not only see them asking questions, we will see them asking information-seeking questions. The second prediction is that children will, at two years of age, use no and not no to talk cogently, both about their own knowledge and about um, the knowledge or ignorance of other people. So I'm going to tell you about uh, three children, um, Adam and Sarah, probably familiar to some of you to, as it were, classic children, studied by Roger Brown in the early days of the language acquisition work in Cambridge. I'm going to focus on the very initial period in which they were, they were uh, trans recorded and transcribed, that's 27 to 36 months. The third, I should, perhaps I should say a little bit more about Adam and Sarah, they were from different socioeconomic backgrounds, Adam is more middle class child, Sarah a working class child. Having said that, they were not particularly precocious or advanced in their language, so they're relatively typical compared to some other children in the child age database uh, where these two children can be found. The third children, as you can see, a Mandarin speaking child. She was the daughter of Bai Yang, who I mentioned a moment ago. Um, she was recorded at a slightly length earlier, at an earlier starting point from 16 months onward, recording stopped at 39 months. In both, in all three cases, I'll be talking about, as I say, questions and the production of no and don't know. So let's just start off by looking at questions. Were these aimed at getting information, or were they aimed more pragmatically at getting help, or were they difficult to classify? Here's the data for Adam, and you can see that even at the beginning, in Adam's case, um, the majority of his questions, that blue line at the top, um, 70% and rising, are information-seeking questions. So he's trying to get information about where objects are, what objects are called, what activity somebody is engaged in, and that, as you can see, that gap uh, why so that by the end of the third year of life, when he's just turning three, um, it's, a, it's a fairly considerable focus on information seeking when he poses a question. Similar but different pattern in the case of Sarah, <coughs> but you can see that, again, when her third birthday is about to arrive, um, the majority of her questions are also information seeking. Um, but the, the, the rise is somewhat slower. And 
in the case of um, Q, again, a similar pattern with the majority of questions being information seeking before the third birthday. So all three children are showing a similar pattern. They're all using language to gather information. Um, and they're using that strategy pragmatically in excess of more pragmatic uh, goals. So the first, I should say that hypothesis one is upheld. Um, children are asking questions, these are information questions. So let's turn to the second prediction. So during this period, um, we identified as you can see, 103 references by Adam, fewer by Sarah, but she, her, her corpus is less dense, and 43 by, by Q. And we analyzed each of these for various linguistic features. The first step was to simply ask whether the children were simply parroting something that their interlocutor had just said. In other words, if their interlocutor said, I don't know, did the child simply repeat that word, no. So there was really a little force behind the child's titles. As you can see from these data, the answer to that question is no. Um, most of these utterances with no are spontaneous. They're not exact repetitions of what their interlocutor has just said or partial repetitions. So in other words, we can look further because there's probably some definite intent to communicate with these words rather than to merely uh, imitate what their parents have said. So granted that the children were not repeating, what were they doing in the context of that conversation? Um, were the remarks pertinent to what had just been said? And in what way might they be pertinent? For example, were they answering a question or were they doing other things? Here in those data, you can see that um, most of these uses of no are replies to a question, um, and a fair number are replies to a comment. In very few cases is the child um, setting up a new topic. So these no utterances are embedded in a long-term conversation, and very often they're replies to a question. The the next question we looked at um, was what, whose knowledge the child was talking about. And we identified three different targets. The child could be talking about their own knowledge, the child could be talking about an interlocutor's knowledge, or a third party, and sometimes um, we, couldn't, we couldn't tell. Here are those data. You can see that there's a fairly heavy focus on the child's own knowledge. But there are also a fair number of remarks about the interlocutor. If anything, one of the most interesting features of this graph is something that's missing. You can see very, very few references to a third party's knowledge. And if you think about all of the classic verbal false belief tasks, the child is invited to think about third party knowledge. So one possible explanation for why the child is showing more cogent talk here than they would when interviewed in the standard tasks is that it's in the context precisely of an, in, of an ongoing conversation where the child is thinking about what they know vis-a-vis -vis an interlocutor, something that does not happen in the standard um, experimental situation. The next thing we did was to look at the pragmatic function of the child reference. And we made a division among three different pragmatic functions. Sometimes the child offered an affirmation. They said, I already know that. Sometimes the child offered a, a, a denial. I don't know. Sometimes the child asks a question, don't you know that, or do you know that? And what we did next is to look at the intersection of 
the graph that I just showed you with respect to who the child was talking about and pragmatic function. But let me just step back a moment. Because the children rarely talked about a third party's knowledge, um, of course, some, there were some cases that we couldn't identify. <coughs> this analysis I'm about to tell you about focused on utterances in which the child referred to their own knowledge or the interlocutor's knowledge only. So in other words, what we did um, was to ask, how often do children affirm their interlocutor's knowledge as compared to their own? How often do children deny their interlocutor's knowledge as compared to their own similarly for questions? If anything, these data prove to be uh, the most unexpected and intriguing. So here are the findings. And the three left-hand bars are for affirmations, the three middle bars are for denials, the three right-hand bars are for questions. And children affirm both with respect to the self and with respect to their interlocutor. They would say, I know you, or sometimes they would say, you know. As you can see, though, with respect to denials, these are almost invariably with respect to the self. So children denied their own knowledge. They did not deny their interlocutor's knowledge. And finally, it flips over when we look at questions. Children pose questions about their interlocutor's knowledge. They don't ask themselves, do I know? I may say that, I mean, because we've only lost three children, it's just conceivable that this is a chance result. We've since looked at eight other children in the child's database, exact same procedure, and all eight show this double asymmetry. So in other words, they um, direct denials at themselves, and they direct questions at their interlocutor. So this is a very, very robust result. I don't know what it means yet, but I think at the very least, it strongly suggests that a notion that we've sort of put aside in theory of mind work, which is the notion of privileged access, is probably important. My guess is that in some sense, children have privileged access to what they do know or don't know. And therefore, they're perfectly capable of denying that they know something, especially when asked a question. Whereas they're much less clear about whether their interlocutor knows something, and that's partly why they pose their interlocutor questions. So they have privileged access to their own knowledge states, but not those of um, their, uh, their interlocutor. What I still am thinking about, um, and we need to do more analysis to figure this out, is whether this privileged access is something that's confined to the verb know, or applies across several different mental states. So if we would take the mental state of see or want, would we see the same asymmetry that we get here, or is it confined to no? My hunch is that it probably is going to generalize to other mental states, but we haven't done the analysis yet to find out. Okay, so I would argue that that second hypothesis that children would talk cogently is upheld. Children um, are quite um, uh, explicit and articulate about what they know as compared to their interlocutor. So let's just quickly summarize what looks like the child's working theory in inverted commas um, of knowledge at this point. The child clearly recognizes that they can get information from other people, all those questions that they were asking. The child recognizes um, that there are things that they know and they assert that. Uh, things that they don't know and they assert that. And it looks as if they take a different stance with respect to their interlocutor, in some sense anticipating that their interlocutor may know things that they themselves do not. It's also worth emphasizing some limitations, something that we did not find when we looked through these spontaneous utterances. As I mentioned, this theory seems to be very much activated in the context of first person and second person. Little talk about third parties. Little talk about 
uh, uh, telling as a source of knowledge. Lou will talk about uh, seeing as a source of knowledge. More generally, Lou will talk about sources. Little evidence of any ability to articulate the distinction between knowledge and belief. And finally, no explicit distinction between self and interlocutor, although as I implied um, earlier, the child seems to have some tacit distinction between self and interlocutor. So, I'm just moving along quickly just to emphasize that asymmetry that I mentioned earlier, where denials are confined to the self and um, <coughs> questions are directed at the other. So, to end with some speculations then, I think on the basis of much of the work that Alia talked about, we can claim that infants have an online theory of mind, which they use in the context of communication, and what I think is the next step is that that online theory gets slashed out in terms of explicit references to knowing and not knowing when children are moving beyond the age of 24 months and possibly earlier. Um, and then from three to four years of age, it looks as if it's being extended to third party uh, states. I think this fits with the evidence from deaf children, which you know shows that children who don't enter into communication are very slow at solving the explicit um, theory of mind tasks. So by implication, early conversations serve as this bridge between the pre-verbal competence and the traditional competence that we've analyzed over a couple of decades now. I'll stop there.